welcome back to your next class this one is my favorite the criminal law to understand the laws and regulations that govern the criminal activity in canada it is essential to have an understanding of the constitution act 1867 this law divides the power of government between the federal and the provincial governments section 9127 of this act confers the federal government the power to make laws in relations to criminal law except the constitution of courts of criminal jurisdiction the criminal law power in canada is primarily enforced by the provinces the key operative word here is op- enforced and the federal government has its jurisdiction over the rules and procedures of evidence in criminal trials the division of jurisdiction over correctional institutions is also divided between the federal and the provincial governments The provinces have jurisdiction over prisons which hold offenders sentenced to imprisonment for less than 2 years and for the offenders who have an imprisonment sentence for more than 2 years the federal government has its jurisdiction over their penitentiaries. The provinces have an ancillary which is a secondary ancillary secondary power to create penal provisions for the enforcement of valid provincial laws as outlined in section 9215. This power has led to issues of paramountcy where similar federal and provincial laws coexist. Moving on to the definition of criminal law. The definition of criminal law includes three important ingredients. The first ingredient is there should be a prohibition which is a specific act or behavior that is prohibited by law. Second, there is a penalty which is a punishment or consequence for breaking that prohibition. third there is a criminal public purpose which is related to public peace order security health or morality it's important to note that these three ingredients are not exhaustive and the definition of criminal law may vary depending on the specific context and interpretation of law the federal government has the power to create laws related to production of sale of food and drugs The margin reference case is an example of how government can use its power to protect public health. In this case, the federal government had passed a law prohibiting manufacturing or sale of margarine, claiming that it was injurious to health. The Supreme Court of Canada ultimately struck down this law. It was con- conceded by the government that the margarine was not actually injurious to health. In another case, Schneider versus the Queen. an example of how federal and provincial governments work together to address drug addiction in this case british columbia heroin treatment act allowed for the detention and assessment and treatment of drug, drug addicts for up to 6 months while the act was challenged on grounds that it was a criminal law the supreme court of canada ultimately found that the coercive elements of the act were incidental to its public health purpose and therefore it was deemed to be of a local and private matter falling under the jurisdiction of province snyder versus queen is also a case which gives an example of how government can use its power to address the use of illicit drugs in this case the government was able to use its power to create laws related to public health to enforce drug addiction treatment this case demonstrates how the government can use its power in creative ways to address public health Supreme Court of Canada also upheld this case by the way. The RJR McDonald versus Canada case is an example of how the government can use its power to prohibit sale, possession and manufacturing of dangerous products like tobacco. The Federal Tobacco Act included a prohibition on advertising cigarettes and other tobacco products which was ultimately struck down on the grounds of freedom of expression. However, the act was held to be valid under the criminal law power and the power to prohibit the use of the tobacco and its harmful effects also encompassed the power to take lesser step for prohibiting advertising. The criminal law aspect of public health is primarily concerned with protecting public health through criminal sanctions such as fines or imprisonment for those who engage in conduct that endangers the health of others. This power is primarily held by the federal government as outlined in section 9127 of the Constitution Act 1867. However, the provinces have jurisdiction over public health matters within their borders 
including power to establish and enforce public health regulations such as quarantine measures, mandatory vaccinations as outlined under section 92.7 of the Constitution Act. In the context of COVID-19, both federal governments and provincial governments have exercised their respective powers to combat the pandemic. The federal government has implemented travel restrictions and mandatory quarantine measures, while the provincial government have implemented various measures such as lockdowns, mask mandates to slow the spread of the virus within their jurisdictions. In summary, criminal law in Canada is primarily a federal responsibility, with provinces having ancillary powers, secondary powers, to create penal provisions for the enforcement of the valid provincial laws. The criminal law power encompasses a variety of areas including food and drugs, illicit drugs, tobacco, public health. The specific definition and interpretation of criminal law may vary depending on the context and the purpose of law. Environmental protection is an important topic that is closely related to health. Both these areas can be addressed by either federal or provincial government depending on the specific legislation in the question. The Supreme Court of Canada has upheld the Canadian Environmental Protection Act as a valid exercise of federal government's criminal law power to protect the environment. However, there is some debate about whether this act is criminal or regulatory in nature. The case of Morgan Tyler v. The Queen dealt with the validity of a provision in the criminal code that prohibited abortions except those approved by a hospital's therapeutic abortion committee. The Supreme Court of Canada upheld the criminal law power of Parliament to prohibit termination of pregnancy even if the termination would not endanger the mother's health. This is in 1975. However, in a subsequent case, Morgan Teller v. The Queen in 1988, the court declared the law to be in violation of Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedom and struck it down. Parliament has not enacted a new law on abortion since and the criminal code no longer prohibits the procedure. In Canada, competition policy is typically regulated at the federal level due to ability of economic activity to cross provincial boundaries and mobility of labour, capital and technology. The federal parliament has passed several acts over the years to regulate competition such as Combines Investigations Act and the Dominion Trade and Industry Commissions Act. These acts have granted various powers to regulators to investigate and prevent anti-competitive behavior. In the modern day, competition policy in Canada is typically regulated under the trade commerce power. The Lord's Day Act which prohibited work on Sundays was originally considered a valid federal law because it had religious purposes. The Supreme Court of Canada confirmed that the federal government's criminal law power could be used to legislate in relation to preserving the sanctity of a of the Christian Sabbath and observing uh, an observance of days of religious significance. However, in Edwards' books, the Supreme Court ruled that the laws that restrict business hours have secular purpose, such as providing pause days, are valid under provincial power to regulate property and civil rights. The Firearms Act 1995, which regulated all guns to be registered and all gun owners to be licensed, was a valid exercise of the federal government's criminal law power. The purpose of the act was to restrict access to inherently dangerous things in order to protect public safety. The act's requirement including criminal law records, checks and mandatory safety courses were all directed towards the school. The court also determined that the act was not merely regulatory and it was enforced through criminal law means such as prohibitions and penalties. The criminal law power can be used to prevent crime even if the law does not have traditional characteristics of a criminal law. For example, binding someone to keep the peace or controlling gun possession are both examples of law that aim to prevent crime. The federal government has the power to legislate in relation to criminal law, including laws aimed at preventing crime and programs to divert young offenders from the criminal justice system. The Young Offenders Act and the Youth Criminal Justice are two examples of federal laws aimed at preventing crime and rehabilitation of young offenders. Now we are going to talk about criminal law and criminal remedy. 
On this slide, we have two important points to discuss. Firstly, we see that the federal government generally does not have the power to create civil remedies. If a federal law is intended to create a if a federal law is intended to create a new civil cause of action, it will likely to be it will likely be invalid as it falls under the provincial power of property and civil rights. However, if a civil remedy is incidental to the main purpose of federal law, it may be upheld. The Supreme Court of Canada has used the functional connection test to determine the validity of such remedies in federal corporation law and federal competition law. Moving on, the Criminal Code of Canada has the authority to authorize a criminal court to order an accused person to pay compensation to the victim for any loss or damage caused. This provision was upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada in case of R v. Zelensky. In conclusion, these two points illustrate the difference between federal power to create civil remedies and criminal law power to create civil remedies. Now we are discussing the relationship between criminal law and regulatory authority. In general, the government's criminal law power cannot support a regulatory regime or scheme that relies on more sophisticated tools than a simple prohibition and penalty. The first case we are looking at is Nova Scotia Board of Censors versus McNeil, where Supreme Court of Canada ruled that censorship of films was not criminal. Instead, they upheld the censorship law as a regulation of an industry within the province falling under the rights of provincial head of power or under property and civil rights. Moving on to R versus Hydro Quebec case. Hydro-Quebec was prosecuted for violating an interim order that restricted the emission of substance to 1 gram per day. The majority upheld that the act was a criminal law because of the administrative procedure for assessing the toxicity of the substance resulted in prohibition enforced by penal sanction, making the scheme sufficiently prohibitory. This reasoning was affirmed in the case Ray Firearms Act, which dealt with the regulation of firearms through licensing. Finally, in the reference Ray Assisted Human Reproduction Act 2010, the federal government passed the Assisted Reproduction Act 2004 to regulate the field of assisted human reproduction. Finally, in the reference Ray Assisted Human Reproduction Act 2010, the federal government passed the Assisted Reproduction Act 2004 to regulate the field of assisted human reproduction containing prohibitions and provisions for enforcing them. The Quebec Court of Appeal ruled that some provisions of the Act were invalid as criminal law because their main purpose was regulation of medical practice and research, which was outside the federal government's jurisdiction. In summary, the government's criminal power cannot support a regulatory regime that goes beyond a simple prohibition and penalty. However, the regulations that rely on prohibitions enforced by penal sanctions can be upheld by criminal law. And I'll repeat, the government's criminal law power cannot support a regulatory regime that goes beyond a simple prohibition and penalty. But regulations that rely on prohibitions enforced by penal sanctions can be upheld under criminal law. The dividing line can be a blurry one as shown in these two cases, but it will be again clear when we do our analysis, when we apply the rules, depending on the case that has been presented to us during the exams. The provincial powers to enact penal laws. This power grants provincial legislatures the authority to impose fines, penalties and imprisonment for enforcing valid provincial laws. Let's explore the subject and understand its nuances. Under Section 9215 of the Constitution Act, provincial legislatures in Canada possess the power to enact penal laws. This means they can establish legal measures to, that involve fine, penalties or imprisonment in order to enforce their own valid laws. It is important to note the, the scope of this power is not extensive as federal power to create offences under Section 9127. This is a ancillary power. 
provincial laws pertaining to the matters falling within the provincial jurisdiction such as property, streets, parks and business activities are generally considered valid. These laws are firmly anchored in the province's legislative authority and are more likely to withstand a constitutional scrutiny. One of the challenges that arise in this area of law is differentiating between valid provincial laws with ancillary penalties and laws that are essentially criminal in nature. This distinction can be quite integrate and gives rise to debates regarding the extent of provincial power under section 9215 and the federal power under section 9127. A notable case shedding light on this issue is Chatterjee versus Ontario. In this case, the court examined the constitutional validity of Civil Remedies Act. The act granted the police the authority to retain the proceeds of unlawful activity without laying criminal charges. The driver involved in this case argued that the act intruded into federal realm of criminal law. The court ruled that primary purpose of the law was related to property rather than criminal law itself. As a result, the provincial forfeiture measures outlined in the Act were deemed independent of federal measures found in the Criminal Code. Consequently, the Court upheld the Act, stated that it fell well within the provincial competence. To wrap up, the provincial power to enact penal laws in Canada is derived from Section 90-15 to of the Constitution Act. While this power is significant, it is not as wide-ranging as the federal power under Section 9127. Provincial laws that pertain to matters falling within provincial jurisdiction are more likely to be valid. The court played a crucial role in determining constitutionality of provincial laws, taking into account their primary purpose and their relationship to federal jurisdiction. The first case, the first case law under criminal law. Reference Ray Validity of Section 5A Dairy Industries Act This case revolves around the constitutionality of a provision within the Dairy Industry Act and raises important questions about the division of power between federal government and the provinces. The Facts Federal government had passed the Dairy Industry Act which contained a provision known as Section 5A. This provision granted the federal government the authority to regulate production, distribution and prices of dairy products. However, the act was challenged on the basis that it exceeded federal government's power of the under the Constitution Act, encroaching upon the jurisdiction of provinces. The issue was whether the federal government possessed the power to regulate the production, distribution and prices of dairy products under the Constitution Act, whether the dairy industry infringed upon the powers of the provinces. To reach a decision, the court applied several key rules and principles. The Constitution Act divides power between federal government and the provinces, granting exclusive power to each. The federal government has exclusive powers over certain matters such as trade and commerce and criminal law. The provinces have exclusive powers over other matters including property and civil rights, as well as local works and undertakings. The federal government's power to regulate trade and commerce does not extend to regulation of specific products. The provinces have the authority to regulate property and civil rights which encompasses regulation of trades, professions and industries within their boundaries. In the decision, court ruled that the federal government did not possess the power to regulate production, distribution and prices of dairy products under the Constitution Act. Furthermore. The court concluded that the Dairy Industries Act infringed upon the power of provinces as it dealt with a matter falling under their jurisdiction, specifically under the property and civil rights. As a result, the court declared this section as invalid. Now let's talk about Reference Ray Firearms Act which is a landmark case heard by Supreme Court in year 2000. This case concerned the constitutionality of the Firearms Act, which is a federal law that regulated the possession, use and storage of firearms in Canada. The federal government had passed the Firearms Act to address concerns around public safety and crime prevention. However, the act was challenged on the grounds that it exceeded federal government's power under Constitution Act and infringed upon the powers of the provinces. The main legal issue before the court 
or whether the federal government had the power to regulate firearms under Constitution Act, whether the act infringed upon the provinces. The court ultimately upheld the constitutionality of the Firearms Act, ruling that the federal government had the power to regulate firearms under the Constitution Act. Specifically, the court found that the regulation of firearms fell well within the federal government's power to regulate trade, commerce and criminal law. The court also ruled that the act did not infringe on the powers of the provinces and it was a valid exercise of the federal power. This case has been significant in shaping the balance of power between federal government and the provinces in Canada, particularly in the regulation of firearms. The last case under the chapter of criminal law is the Reference Array Genetic Non-Discrimination Act 2020. This case involved the constitutionality of the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, a federal law that aimed to prohibit discrimination based on genetic characteristics in Canada. The federal government had passed the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, which prohibited genetic discrimination and established a process for individuals who believed they had been subject to such discrimination to file complaints. However, the act was challenged on grounds that it exceeded the federal government's power under the Constitution Act and infringed on the powers of the provinces. The Supreme Court of Canada was asked to consider whether the federal government had the power to enact the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act and whether the act infringed on the powers of provinces. Ultimately, the court ruled that the federal government did not have the power to enact Genetic Non-Discrimination Act under the Constitution Act and it did not fall within any of the federal government's enumerated powers. Furthermore, the court also found that the act infringed on the powers of the provinces as it regulated a matter that fell within their jurisdiction of property and civil rights. As a result, court declared Genetic Non-Discrimination Act to be of no force and effect. In summary, this case highlighted the importance of understanding the limits of federal and provincial powers under the Constitution Act when it comes to enacting laws and regulations in Canada. That's it for today's class on criminal law. The next will be on ancillary powers and see you in the next class. Bye.